Welcome to the channel, where we delve into the mind of a villain. In this entry, we'll be taking a look at Gustavo Fring from Breaking Bad and its prequel spin-off, Better Call Saul. One of the best written villains to grace the television screen, Gus Fring was a master of the double life, with his behavior split between an on-stage and off-stage performance. On stage in the public eye, he is the friendly and accommodating owner of a chain of fast food joints, always ensuring the satisfaction of his customers with a warm smile. He's also an esteemed member of the Albuquerque community, known for his philanthropy and his support for local law enforcement. But offstage, beneath the facade, Gus is actually a cold-blooded and ruthless narcotics distributor running his empire under the cover of his legitimate businesses. His effort to blend into the community, as well as his proximity to the DEA, are all part of his scheme of hiding in plain sight and keeping his enemies closer. In his true state, Gus is stoic and somber, a far cry from his more amiable self that he uses as a disguise at Poyos Hermanos. He is a man of deep thought, often in a contemplative state as he stares blankly into a distance. Even without knowing the specifics of his past, one can easily see that Gus has experienced the hard side of life by the pain that is often reflected in his eyes. But what makes Gus such a well-received character? For starters, he stands out from the rest of his criminal peers and unlike them, he has managed to run a successful drug ring and still maintain his social acceptance. As he tells Mike in this scene, Gus comments that he is different from the Salah Mankars, implying a higher sense of morality. It's no secret that what is common is seldom highly regarded. Gus is anything but common, possessing a rare sense of professionalism and pragmatism. While his methods are abhorrent, what he has achieved and his work ethic are remarkable to say the least. This is seen by the tight ship he runs, by his rule of not working or trusting addicts, and by his aforementioned ability to hide in plain sight. Gus holds himself to high standards, which is what draws him to Walter White's superior product. But perhaps the single most noteworthy trait of Gus's is his reoccurring attribute of delayed gratification. This is seen on several fronts, one of which is in the area of romantic relationships. In his final scene in Better Call Saul, Gus is seen striking up a friendly conversation with a man he apparently has interest in. The topic reaches that of Gus's special wine, which he has saved up for a special day, which most probably is referring to the day of his fulfilled wrath against the cartel. Gus's previously cheery mood disappears, and he finds an excuse to leave the man. Perhaps Gus knows that given by the nature of his work, such a romantic relationship would not be possible, and would likely distract him or pose a danger to anyone he comes close with. This is also likely a result of his calculative and cautious nature, which we see him exhibit continuously throughout the show. Gus's exclusion from relationships also extends to the child figures in his life, whether of his own or not, as seen by the toys in his house when Walter visits and when he mentions that children won't eat a certain dish of his cooking. Throughout both of the series, there is no record of Gus having any interaction with any of them. While all that is impressive, the strongest form of delayed gratification for Gus comes with his patience and his revenge against the cartel, specifically against the prime object of his hatred, Don Hector Salamankar. While he seethes with resentment from the murder of his partner, Gus would go to great lengths to preserve his revenge, even saving Hector's life and providing him health care to keep him alive for his final retaliation. Like the wine he chooses to keep, he savors the sweeter taste of revenge the longer it has time to ferment. Gus comes off as a compelling character by the tragedy that drives him. 
He appears to have a sympathetic edge from how the show frames him, from the event of the murder of his partner during a cartel discussion gone south. But while the death of his partner was a tragedy, it hardly accounts for his evil. One needs look no further than his pre-existing choice of being a drug dealer, which is hardly a noble profession. Gus's evil tendencies, specifically his vindictive nature, began in his childhood in Chile, one which was marked by poverty. In his story to Hector about the co that stole his fruit from the tree, Gus's penchant for a slow revenge is seen by his decision to slowly torture the animal as punishment for the theft of his fruit. Further indications of Gus's troubled childhood are seen through his charitable donations towards youth development causes. When asked why specifically those foundations, he implies of the little guidance he had as a child and that he wishes to make an early impact on the kids. Not much else is known about Gus's past except for the possibility that he was a military personnel involved in General Pinochet's dictatorship in Chile. But whatever his rank was, it's sufficient to say that he was important enough that the cartel didn't dare lay their hands on him. At present, Gus uses similar methods of force in the running of his criminal empire. We see this by how he treats Nacho as an expendable asset without any sympathy when he has faithfully acceded to his every request. This eventually becomes a source of conflict between him and Mike. But more than that, Gus will not hesitate to kill to protect his business interest, as seen when he orders the execution of Werner Ziegler to protect his hidden super lab. For Gus, murder is not just a form of punishment, but also a warning to keep others in check. Gus has no qualms about getting his hands dirty, whether it's at his restaurant or in his criminal dealings. Whether it's to fish into the rubbish bin for a customer's watch or handling an execution with his hands, no task is too meager for him. As previously mentioned, Gus runs a tight ship exemplified by his excessive need for control and for things to go his way. If he can't tempt with honey or use direct force, he would resort to manipulation or any dirty trick in the book. To persuade Walter to resume his cooking after he quit, Gus exploits his sense of pride and jealousy by getting Jesse to do it instead, knowing that it would aggravate him. When Walter later expresses guilt over the morality of his actions, Gus appears to empathize with him, but then slowly shifts to indirectly changing Walter's mind by telling him that a man provides for his family even if his actions will cost him their love. Gus's ability to influence is also seen by his nonverbal style of communication. With just a subtle shift in his expression, he takes on the appearance of a man who is on the brink of boiling over with rage. In his attempt to convince Gale to speed up his learning process of Walter's recipe, a simple disapproving look was enough to get Gale to reduce his previous requirement of a few more cooks to just one. Gus's need for control also manifests in his obsessive compulsive disorder, which comes during times of stress as a coping mechanism of sorts. We see this with his dissatisfaction with the cleanliness of the oil fryer at a time when he had to lose millions in a sacrificed deal drop. Later, in another perplexing situation when his life was threatened, we find Gus hard at work, scrubbing his bathtub with a toothbrush. Perhaps Gus's excessive control gives rise to another one of his traits, his penchant for observing the fine details. Gus is a man of keen observation and often being able to quickly read between the lines, a skill which has saved his life more than once. Just by looking at Hector's expression, he is able to accurately determine that his old nemesis was of sound mind, giving him the reassurance that he would not be deprived of his revenge. Later, after the ambush on Larlo's house, Gus is able to tell just from Hector's expression yet again that his nephew was still alive and still a present threat against him. 
On top of his keen observational skills, Gus is an opportunist, a brilliant tactician who can see potential in the midst of chaos. After he takes control of Nacho, he uses him to frame the rival gangs so that the twins would do his dirty work. Later in Breaking Bad, when the twins demanded revenge for Tuco's death, Gus cunningly aims them at Hank Schrader, knowing that attacking the DEA would put a huge target on themselves. Over the course of the series, Gus's quest for revenge and his resultant conflict with the cartel leads him further down the path of moral decay. At the start of Breaking Bad, Gus appears to be more honorable than his peers by his claim that he doesn't find fear to be an effective motivator. And in the scene when he confronts Walter after the death of Combo's killers, Gus expresses much indignation over the suggestion that he would sanction the death of a minor. But later on, in his threat to Walter after Hank's investigation into his affairs, Gus has degraded to the point where he threatens Walter's family and specifically expresses hostile intent toward his newborn daughter. But since it was just a verbal threat, perhaps a greater sign of Gus's instability would be the killing of his henchman, Victor, due to the fact that he was flying too close to the sun. Over time, with his adoption of more heinous methods, Gus has slowly become more and more like the Salar Munkars that he despises. When considering Gus's evil, a key scene in Better Call Saul provides some insight. In this scene between Gus and Mike, the topic becomes that of whether Gus's charity was meant to make up for his evil deeds. Gus responds that it makes up for nothing, and then he describes himself with the following phrase, I am what I am. This brief but significant statement reveals much of his self-image. By saying I am what I am, Gus appears to have a deterministic perception of life, one where he is simply swept by the flow of his circumstances without any ability of his own to change them. Maybe this is true to some extent, as we are all largely influenced by our circumstances, whether they are positive or negative. Though no fault of his own, Gus was born into poverty, where he was quickly exposed to the harsh side of life and likely had to resort to underhanded means to feed himself and his family. Perhaps to escape that poverty and to survive in the dictatorship of Chile, he had no choice but to join Pinochet's military. But due to the subsequent collapse of the regime, Gus was forced to flee to Mexico. Or perhaps Gus might have been forced to leave Chile due to his sexuality. Subsequently, the death of his partner was beyond his control and he could only watch in sorrow as he lay face to face with his partner's lifeless corpse. Now, of course, this is a very simplistic and also speculative assumption of his life's events, but the fact remains that Gus has indicated his unwillingness or his inability to change when he says, I am what I am. And if responsibility for his character is deflected away, it stands to reason that he would point it to the circumstances of his life that have shaped him. As a result, Gus makes no apology for the person he is. But what Gus misses out on is the fact that just like Mike in his scene, he also has a choice. Every decision he makes has the potential to drive him further down the path of evil or to halt his descent. Every time before he makes another shady deal, he is at a crossroads. Every time before he orders someone's execution, he is at a crossroads. Sadly, in his obsession with revenge, Gus can see no other choice but to align all his purposes with that of his vengeance against the cartel. He is probably rich enough to retire with more money than he can ever spend, but is held back by the immense anger he carries. Gus's life is an example of the compounding power of hatred, with his vendetta against Hector reaching proportions a hundredfold beyond that of the original offense. After stopping Mike from killing him, he says that a bullet to the head would be too humane, although that was the exact manner of execution for his partner. 
and although his revenge against the rest of the cartel was fulfilled, Gus still leaves Hector alive at the nursing home and enjoys torturing him with the knowledge that his family name dies with him, as member after member of his family is killed. It's likely that Gus would have kept him alive as long as possible to maximize his suffering, perhaps even waiting for a few more years before putting Hector out of his misery. He only acted when his business was threatened, when Hector appeared to be ratting him out to the DEA. Revenge was Gus's purpose, but eventually revenge became his downfall, leading to a simultaneous death with his most hated enemy. He had plenty of chances to let Hector meet his demise, many of which would simply require him to sit back and do nothing. Unfortunately, Gus was too attached to the pleasure of torturing his nemesis that he paid for it with his life. At the end, Gus was a two-faced villain, one who mastered the craft of adopting a double persona to preserve his public image. His appearance before his death exemplifies that notion. He was a victim of his difficult past, but it's made more tragic by the fact that he saw no way to change his path in the present. So what do you think of Gustavo Fring from Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, folks? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching and take care.